Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, April program of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. If uh, my name is Ricky Leo, I'm the president. Um, if you're not familiar with the Historical Society, we were um, organized in 1975, uh, and our mission was to bring together uh, people with a mutual interest in the important history of the Chinese and Chinese Americans uh, role in uh, Southern California. If uh, you would like to know more about us, uh, we have a website, chssc.org, and um, we welcome you to join us. Uh, anyways, uh, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Gene Moy. He's a past president who will introduce our speaker tonight. Great. Good evening, everyone. Hi, and thank you for all for joining in uh, this evening. And it's been a great day. I was actually in Chinatown earlier and enjoying the sunshine and, and looking at our houses and uh, chatting with our electrician who's been doing improvements to our property. So we're, we're, uh, uh, it's been a very positive day. We had a lot of things done. We had our archivists and our interns working away today. So it, it was a, a, a great and busy day uh, overall. But now that we're, I'm settled in at home, I'm able to kind of share with you uh, some insights from a scholar that we have been working with. Uh, Isa Xianglong uh, Quintana has been a, an integral part of our academic team that is heading the Five Chinatowns project. Uh, as some of you know, we have uh, been working, uh, our, or actually our, our three uh, team leaders, co-leaders have been uh, leading a, a group of scholars, of uh, community people, of students, in putting together a book on the uh, different Chinatown communities that we have seen in LA that uh, that really have helped define what we are today. And one of the uh, team leaders, uh, Isa or Isabella has been uh, independently working on uh, some research into the area of uh, things like uh, multiraciality, uh, ethnic, ethnic uh, identity. And, uh, she's been analyzing the um, exploring really what it means to be a girl or a female or a woman uh, growing up in these um, ethnic communities of Chinatown or rather China City and um, and um, Alvera Street I'll get it out uh, <laughs> but what what that era of the late 1920s and early 1930s meant for a lot of people uh, was that there was a uh, growing sense and awareness of our, our ethnic uh, communities and really how they may have contributed and what would be of interest to the larger uh, or then dominant society. Uh, the uh, Chinese Inclusion Act was still in place when China City was formed, when it was opened in 1938-39. And, uh, there were still many uh, uh, obstacles for uh, full citizenship uh, for for many people of color in the Asian and Latino community. So, uh, our so Isabella Quintana Quintana has been really looking into uh, the self image and the identity. Uh, shifts that occurred during this period as a result of being involved in these uh, these really uh, highly marketed uh, uh, locations of China City and, and Olvera Street. It, it created a new image for LA. So what I'd like to do is to let, um, let Isa explain a little bit more about what her what she has found and, and really uh, and maybe 
some of what she discusses will resonate with some of us in this audience here, many of us who have uh, grown up and connected to these uh, two communities. So may I present uh, Isabella Quintana? Great. Isa? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we're fine. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jean. Um, I just, you know, I first I first came to the Historical Society in 2006 when I moved to LA to do my dissertation work, and I met Jean almost right away. Um, Jean's one of the most knowledgeable and generous people that I know, and um, I know a lot of knowledgeable people. So um, I have learned so much from this community. So I'm really glad to be here with you all today. Um, what I'm sharing today is is part of a brand new project that I'm working on. Um, I just started to work on it. So I'm gonna share with you some sort of pre preliminary work that I've, things that I've been thinking about um, and some um, you know questions and uh, uh, stories that I'm thinking about. So um, as many of you may know, I, uh, I just finished finishing up my book, uh, my first book project, which is about Chinese and Mexican residents of the Los Angeles Plaza area. So I look at um, that these communities before Union Station was built, when um, before they were all kicked out. Um, it's expected to be published in the spring of next year. So um, it's very exciting. Um, and in that project, I focused on the years from 1871, um, which is the, the year of the Chinese massacre, um, until 18, 1938, which is the year that China City opened. Um, and actually today I'm gonna talk about 1938. Um, so, the, so 1938, the completion of the construction of Union Station and the grand opening of China City um, and New Chinatown. Um, so, um, so this this project um, it begins where the my where my old project left off, um, and so I'm really excited to hear um, any suggestions that you all might have, um, any any uh, questions or suggestions for future um, future directions. Um, this is all very new to me. So, um, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Oops, where did it go? Okay. All right, there we go. All right. So um today today the what I'm gonna talk about sort of centers around one um particular uh newspaper article. Um and that was in 1938. Um this is the image that accompanied that um that that newspaper article. Um, so in December of 1938, Josephine Gomez and Catalina Cruz pro posed for a photograph marking a joint open house of China City and Olvera Street in Los Angeles Plaza area, emerging tourist districts. Just a few months earlier in July, um, Los Angeles had celebrated China City's grand opening, and the photograph appeared in the LA Times um, alongside this the heading um, sainted Chinese princess of Mexico to be honored. Um, and the accompanying article showcased the opening event um, of the festival, so, um, sort of advertising it to um, for folks to come and visit. And it said, quote, in a formal ceremony, the Mexican people of Olvera Street will present a shrine dedicated to the saint to China City. So, um, so you can see there in the in the picture that there's um, there's a picture of of the shrine behind um, the two the two girls. Um, so the fiesta surrounding the ceremony promised to be a spectacle of exotic foods, trinkets, and people. There would be free teas and sweets, um, displays of priceless antiques, um, a puppet show, variety of crafts, music, dancing. Um, Mexican and Chinese films would be shown at the Plaza Theater, and there would be no entrance fees um, to see the Chinese temple in China City, which um, usually charged a fee to, to enter. So in the photo we see here, um, Josephine and Catalina stood in front of the shrine. It was nestled into a nicho on the Macy Street side of the wall that surrounded China City. 
Um, so that's the, chi the side that faced Olvera Street. So, um, so China City was completely enclosed by a wall, um, and um, it was about about one block big. Um, so it wasn't wasn't too big, but um, it was enclosed by a wall. So this is the wall that faced um, faced Macy Street, or which is now um, Cedar Travis and uh, or Sunset. I think well, it's it they kind of chain they kind of meet right there at that at that point. Um, so they're across the street from Olvera Street. Um, they wore Mexican embroidered blouses and skirts, the style of dress that's known as China Poblana that had come to symbolize Mexican national modernity in the 1920s. So also not pictured in this, um, in this, in this photo was Li Yaqing, a Chinese woman pilot and actress who would soon, who would join them um, as the ceremony's guest of honor. To augment the experience even more, the Times noted that senoritas from Olvera Street will wear their China Poblana costumes. So, um, and to give you a sense of what the, the, um, let's see, there we go. If, if you were to zoom in on this photograph and um, take a look at the inscription there inside the shrine, um, this is what it says. Um, in memory of the Chinese princess of Mexico, Cien Fa, Christened Catarina de San Juan, creator of Mexico's national costume named the China Poblana. Twas for her devotion and great work for the sick and the needy that she was sainted in the city of Puebla in the 17th century. So a lot of questions um, can arise from this, from this very short newspaper article. Um, and so I'm gonna focus on just a couple of things today, but primarily I'm interested in um, Chinese and Mexican girls and young women, and what it meant to be modern at this time and to be a, be a girl, what it meant to be a modern girl or modern woman um, in this time and period in Los Angeles. A lot of times in history, um, historic, historians talk about the 1920s as the time when um, sort of these ideas about modern womanhood um, are, are, are prevailing and coming out like in, um, as in the 1920s, there's um, a sense of consumerism, increased consumerism and positivity. But what's interesting about this is that it's in the 1930s. So this is um, this is during the Great Depression, right? There's um, there's increased um, surveillance of Chinese and Mexican residents in the Plaza area, but generally also for these communities who um, who were targeted for removal um, and deportation. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about first um, gendered marketing of the Los Angeles origin story, which which is um, arguing that China City and Olvera Street together um, uh, tell an or a certain kind of origin story of Los Angeles, um, and that they were especially marketed towards an audience of white women. Um, I want to look at how this place might also symbolize the history of racialized and gendered exclusion, which I talked about just briefly just now, but I will talk about a little bit more. Um, and secondly, I'm going to talk about um, Mexican modernity. So looking at the Chino Poblana um, figure um, was as, as a, a, a symbol of Mexican nationalism, especially in the 20s. Um, and um, so it's sort of interesting that this that this is Mexican nationalism that's being used to celebrate um, to celebrate a uh, a place where that is really promoting um, American nationalism. And then thirdly, um, I want to start to look at and, and ask questions about what about what these women um, these here we have Josephine Catalina and Yaqing. Um, but they were often the faces of Olvera Street and China City. Um, there were a lot of them, um, a lot of children that were there were there because their parents worked there or they ran shops. Um, so they spent a lot of time there. And um, if, sometimes they were working uh, also, but sometimes they were also just wait, you know, waiting for their parents to be done um, or you know, taking care of younger siblings or younger community members. Um, so there's there was there was young people there and um, and specifically, I think because of the audience, um, this this um, this intended audience of the of of these tourist zones, um, were focused on for focus on white women. There's a particular um, interest I think that they have in um, seeing young um, young women and young girls in and and how they lend an, um, a sense of authenticity to the experience. Um, okay, so. 
just to give um, just a little bit of, of um, historical context um, in the Plaza area. So um, the Plaza, the Plaza was, um, is, I should say is, um, it is a, a small park um, that it, that was at the end of Oveda Street opposite from um, where China City was. And I apologize that I didn't, didn't include a map here. Um, the plaza area, the area surrounding the plaza had been since, um, you know, had was was the original um, sort of Spanish colonial settlement um, up on top of Yangna, which was a, a Tongva village. Um, and um, and so the the Pueblo of Los Angeles was built in the urban planning um, sort of style of the Spanish colonial style. And um, and so over the years after you know the United States came um, and and California became part of the United States, um, you know, they, then Chinese Chinese people came and um, started settling there in the Plaza too, um, as did many others many others. But um, over time, they they it was especially um, Chinese and Mexican um, neighborhoods um, there, in part because they were not really allowed to live anywhere else. Like there's still very strong. Um, practices of segregation and redlining and things that happened um, over the course of, of many decades before. But importantly, um, that these were these were really vibrant communities, right? They they shared spaces, they they um they lived they lived vibrant lives. They there was families, there was workers, right? There was people that um, you know, they they had everyday lives and you know, um, they had fun together. They also faced a lot of hardship um, together. Um, but it's important, I think, to think about these um, these communities that were there before. Um, so there's also, as I mentioned, a long and deep history of border exclusion um, practices in that area. That's um, that's which is something that I focus on in in, in my book. Um, but it is. Um, one one thing to think about in terms of Olvera Street and China City is that they're coming, they're coming to LA right after um, sort of this really intense period in um, the the 1930s of um, of of just border right um, border exclusion and policing and um, and um, deportations. So in the 19, in, um, let's see, Oveda Street opened in 1930. Um, and in 1931 occurred the, um, the big, um, what people call the Plaza Raid, which was um, during, during the Great Depression, um, the, there was a national project to rid the country of as many Mexicans as possible. And um, Los Angeles was especially, um, especially, um, especially, did a lot of this, right? Los Angeles is especially one of those, um, one of the places where this happened. Um, and in fact, the plaza itself was the site of this plaza raid, which um, in which the the poli police, city police worked with um, sort of immigration agents and they wore plain clothes and they showed up in the middle of the plaza in the, um, um, in just on a Sunday afternoon when people were, you know, there enjoying their their time, maybe they went to church, maybe they're, um, you know, just hanging out at the at the plaza or going to restaurants that were nearby and things like that. So the there's they locked it down and um, rounded up both Mexican and Chinese and one Japanese person. Um, so this was, you know, this is this this was a, a tactic that was used to incite fear amongst families that were afraid of being um, separated. Um, should somebody be um, be deported and they not know about it, well, similar to a lot of um, a lot of experiences today. Um, so also this is as as Jean mentioned earlier, this was still Chinese exclusion was happening, and so if we think about um, the um, the Plaza raid and also these um, Chinese exclusion that these these communities they lived so close to each other that they witnessed these exclusion practices this they they witnessed this happening to each other um, over the years and so they were so the, the anyway so the 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 um, plaza raid was one way that the city was city removed a lot of Mexicans one third of the Mexican population in Los Angeles um, and and to make way for this tourist zone. Um, 
And we also know that um, that also uh, old Chinatown, the majority of old Chinatown was demolished in the 1930s also to build Union Station, which is part of this tourist zone as well. So it's important to think about this, this sort of like as this history of these communities um, when we're thinking about these young people that are participating in, you know, are like they're they're participating in these tourist um, tourist zones. Um, they are um, in their in their their um, being it. maybe they're they're oh, excuse me they're being um, sort of their their faces are being used um, to um, to earn money for the city. Um, but they're also people that um, that were part of communities that that probably knew about all of these things that were happening, right? So that was only within the last um, within maybe like eight years of this this event here that um, that this newspaper article talks about. So um, so modernity, um, which I talk about, modernity is one way that um, cities and nations have claimed to be modern by telling a story of their own past. It's like, how did they get to be so, um, you know, so, so prominent? And so, um, so it's a celebration of their, of their prowess, right? Um, and Oveta Street and China City are examples of how Los Angeles did this. Um, so, I don't have an image of that one. So, Christine Sterling um, was was the a white woman a socialite who um, is credited for um, for thinking of the idea to to turn Olvera Street into a tourist zone. Um, she first began her work at the Plaza during the 1920s um, with the historic preservation project that centered on on restoring Los Angeles' oldest standing building, the Avila Adobe, which we know is um, is a major part of the Overa Street um, today. The project grew to um, encompass the entire block, right? Um, so where, where the Avila Adobe is, is located. Um, the Overa Street Marketplace was then and is now a tourist site um, and a national historic monument. If you go to El Pueblo de Los, de Los Angeles um, historical monument, the tagline still reads um, the birthplace of Los Angeles, right? So there, so it's definitely about sort of telling the story of how Los Angeles came to be. But unlike Oveta Street, um, China City doesn't no longer stand. So it, it was destroyed by fire in 1949 um, after being open for just, just over a decade. So importantly in, in um, oops, I missed something. Importantly, in 1920, um, Los Angeles had become the fifth largest city in the United States, seeking to capitalize on and this drastic rise of consumer culture and consumerism in the, the 1920s and this like booming indus industrial expansion of, of the previous decades late in the late 19th century and early 20th century. So um, Christine Sterling and um, city urban planners, they worked to remove and demolish these Mexican and Chinese neighborhoods. Um, both of these neighborhoods were seen um, in main, by mainstream America and were defined by the city of LA as filthy, as diseased, dilapidated, um, and you know should be should be removed um, as you know for um, for as a public safety hazard, right? Um, so there's many different ways that um, and reasons that people used to remove um, remove these communities. So during the 30s and 40s, um, Los Angeles found itself amidst a huge, uh, huge modern developments that for that um, that would brand the city's economic and cultural importance. They wanted to be the center of the great the great Hollywood motion picture industry. Um, it was an exciting tourist destination for white Americans. So Oveta Street, um, as I mentioned, opened to the public in 1930. Um, it had colorful booths and restaurants lined one block of the street. It branched off the plaza, um, many of which were operated by Mexican retailers, sold food, tourist mementos, um, curiosities, and generally everyday items to um, those plaza area residents that were still there. And China City was similarly built as a colorful um, tourist-centered marketplace located just across the street, as I said. Um, and it was conceived to be the Chinese counterpart to Mexican Olvera Street. When China City was um, a recreation of Hollywood's 
idea of China and Chineseness, both figuratively and literally, because the set of the film Good the Good Earth, Hollywood's rendition of of a, what a Chinese place might, would look like, and it provided a marketplace of experiences for um, for Chinese of Chinese experiences of Chineseness for tourists, much like Olvera Street provided a marketplace of experiences about Mexicanness. So the two tourist areas would soon be enhanced in 1939 with the opening of Union Station, the city's Art Deco Spanish Revival architectural masterpiece um, that really symbolize um, the city's modernity and it's really um, designed to do that, exactly that. So the idea was that one could get off the train at Union Station, cross the street and be able to experience um, both Olvera Street and Chinatown and um, sort of experience Los Angeles's past um, in a safe environment and then um, be able to then then maybe they go to Hollywood or some other place and they, they experience Los Angeles's present. Um, <clears throat> so, so again, these were urban renewal projects, right? And so uh, and I argue that urban renewal projects that were um, that were actually border practices as well. Um, so they capitalized on Wild West narratives, Hollywood films, they used the plaza area as real estate for the city's promotion of the tourism. They also um, they also recast the city um, where so, so people would come at, they would come in Union Station, they cross the street, they would they might have an exotic meal um, experience um, uh, care, carefully curated depiction. Um, so, but one thing to consider, and because we know that, um, that people, there were people that worked there, right, and these communities, and so as we were talking about earlier, there were children, um, and, um, Oveta Street and China City, they, they were spectacular places, but also where other stories were being told or being understood, um, and I want to look at how maybe girls and young women who worked in these tourist spaces might have understood the story of that place differently than what the narrative that was being sold was. So um, white women, they were central to this commercial enterprise, uh, both creators and consumers. And like many US tourist sites, Oveta, Oveta Street in China City, they were designed to to sell um, Manifest Destiny, right? The story of Manifest Destiny, um, that a story of Los Angeles that would fit into the popular folklore of, of the American West, a place that was won by Anglo-Americans and then successfully become part of the United States. So in Christine Sterling, she first began, began her work um, she, to preserve the city's Spanish origins. Um, she was sometimes called the mother of Olvera Street and she garnered a lot of financial support from um, sit other city boosters, but also particularly she drew a lot of support from other white women socialites at the time um, when many, many popular representations of Los Angeles also drew on sort of a romanticized conception of Spanish, Spanish colonialism. Um, and we say romanticized because um, there's these sort of these, these um, stories like romance story, like love stories. Um, and things that were circulating in, um, in American mainstream media about Los Angeles and about the Spanish past. So um, Sterling wanted to also recreate the experience of visiting curio shops. So when, when Chinatown was destroyed, um, after that she, she noticed that, um, that one of the things that, that, that white, white people had enjoyed about going to Chinatown was, was visiting curio shops. And after Chinatown was um, destroyed, she, she thought, well, we need to ha still have that. We need to bring that back. Um, it was because um, that was, that was such a major part of, of the experience of going to Chinatown. And so, um, so she, so that on one hand, that was one of, that was one of her reasons to open China, China city. Another one was that, um, that she, and she's, She's quoted many times, sort of saying that, well, you know, we need to um, give give Chinese um, Chinese people um, some of their um, their livelihood back because we've taken it away from for building Union Station. Um, so um, she said similar things also about Olvera oh, Street. We need to give um, give Mexicans uh, right this opportunity to to um, to hold on to their culture, right? 
Um, so this was sort of the way that she she understood that. Um, let's see. Yeah, so white women made up the majority of the LA population in the in 1920. So earlier than that, it was it was very heavily uh, a male population, um, and this changed every decade um, after after you know since the 18, 1848, um, and um, and white women became the majority in 1920. So it's kind of the first time that that white that women are the majority. Um, and they had migrated to the city. Many of them had migrated to the city to take part in the sort of glitz and emerging, uh, you know, motion picture industry. Um, they they found independence in the 1920s and, and were able to find jobs. Um, and they became a central audience for Western tourism. Um, and they also there also was the increased accessibility of the the automobile for a middle class that afforded them. Um, what women across the United States, particularly middle class, um, middle class white women, afforded them the chance to um, to design road trips for their families, so they could drive across the country and um, sort of experience that live the experience of um, west of moving west, right, um, and to Los Angeles. <clears throat> so, in fact, a a, um, a shopkeeper in 1918, he was quoted saying. Well, there are more women in Los Angeles than any other city in the world, and it's the movies that bring them. So there's a centrality of um, of how Hollywood played um, played a role there. Right. So, um, so, so that's so that's one one aspect of of this project that I'm interested in exploring more. Um, because it talks about, because it sort of deals with the modernity and the way that Los Angeles and, um, sort of is trying to imagine itself. But then there's also, um, as as we as I mentioned, this image of the the girls standing in front of the uh, in front of the the shrine, um, and the Chino Poblana, as this as the inscription says, right, um, Mexico's national costume, right. Um, so the Chino Poblana um, figure was. Um, it was the Chino Poblano was um, festival itself was framed um, was framed as a way that um, to maybe to bring these two sort of cultures together, right? Um, to and and to just kind of also it's kind of like spectacular, right? To think of like this the way that it's um, portrayed there the sainted Chinese princess of Mexico, of course. Even now today, I mean, even I was like, oh, what's that about? Like I wanted to know more about about it. Um, so it so it really, you know, it's to strike up curiosity and bring um bring people to to the site. Um, <clears throat> so um let's see the, the China Poblana dress and I'll, I'll turn to the next oops and there's some of the kids. Oh this is what I was gonna show um just just how central um White women were to the tourist industry. So this is this is a railroad um, advertisement um, that is clearly marketed towards um, towards white women. You see that there's a little girl even that's looking at a map there at the bottom left. Um, their families looking at the map. They're you know ready to experience that um, that westward movement. So sorry I forgot to show that earlier. Um, so this is uh, an example of the Chino Poblana dress. Um, this is actually one that is at the Rhode Island School of Design, um, and so it's you know this is it's it's a well known um, sort of um, it's a well known dress, um, and it's been studied in many different ways. And so if we think about this, the Chino Poblana dress, um, it was popularized in the discourse of Mexican modernity in the post revolutionary period. So beginning in the 1920s, after the Mexican Revolution, as Mexico is trying to redefine itself. Um, in, in as an independent nation um, that or redefine itself as a new nation, I should say, a new nation. Um, <clears throat> and in the 1920s, much like in the United States, there was this sense that um, that of what a modern woman could be. Um, what did it mean to um, for Mex for this Mexico to be modern? And so there's many variations of this story um, of the Chino Poblana, but one example proposes that she that the Chino Poblana was was an Asian woman, um, although 
possibly Chinese, possibly Filipina, possibly Indian, um, a woman who had arrived in Mexico during the 17th century. And she's often credited for creating this style of dress, this embroidered dress, and that later came to symbolize, as I said, Mexican national identity. Um, and in particular, it was a, a way that Mexican femininity could be expressed too, right? Um, this is the this is what um, what maybe a modern Mexican woman would wear, right? Um, is is ideally figured in this in this um, clothing. So this, the scholar Joanne Hirschfield has shown that Latina Poblana become, became a fashion alternative to the flapperista style. So think about the flappers in the 1920s that happened also in Mexico. Um, and so there, so the flapper was one version of the modern Mexican woman and Latina Poblana was another. And we also see in this time period, um, Frida Kahlo, um, who's often seen wearing the Chino Poblana um, style as well. So, um, so this is a sort of a, um, a way that Mexico was um, exoticized, uh, right? This this femininity based on an indigenous indigenous cultures, right? This was um, this was a, a woman. That, so the Chino Poblana was a woman, and um, and she so she is credited for creating the dress um, in Puebla, which is um, in Oaxaca. And there's a there's a big statue um, to to her um, dedicated to her in in the city um, in Oaxaca City. Um, so it became this uh, um, sort of narrative tool, right? And if we think about this as a Mexican nationalist um, narrative, it's interesting to think about that alongside the American nationalist narrative that's being painted in Olvera Street and China City, because because that it doesn't leave room necessarily for a Mexico of today, right? Um, Olvera Street is painted as, as a Mexico of the past, a Mexico that doesn't exist here anymore because the United States has been um, successful in its, in its conquest of the American West um, and uh, Los Angeles in particular. So, it, so the Chino Poblana narrative doesn't, doesn't neatly fit into that myth. Um, and so this, it's kind of this moment, I think, where um, you might think about how Sterling herself, had, she has to reckon with, um, you know, real people, right? People, people that worked with her, uh, or that were that she chose. She carefully, she carefully chose people to um, to uh, run those booths in, in the in Olvera Street. Um, but it's also sort of it's a Mexican present, right? It's this is Mexican modernity and and Mexican um, national identity of the twenties and thirties, and um, Olvera Street is painting a picture of of Mexico as having been a, a conquered a conquered nation. Um, but it's a Mexico of the present, also, right? Because this is what this image is. So there's kind of there's kind of this contradiction that's happening there, um, and that's something that I that I want to um, explore a little bit more. Um, So then the next part that I've started to look into is um, Li Yaqing. Um, Li Yaqing was the, the, the woman that I mentioned earlier who was the guest of honor for the, um, the ceremony of the Chino Poblana Shrine um, in the newspaper article. And, um, you know, I, I, had, I had never heard of her before, um, before seeing this article. And so I did some, some background um, looking into her and um, she actually, um, she was a, a she was a child um, a child act, uh, actor actress in China, um, and she um, but she sort of she left the the acting that she left the film industry um, for a little while to go to school um, and in Europe, and part of that was because of um, of the impending war um, with Japan. So this is this is when World War II um, had started in other places. The United States had not yet entered the war. Um, let's see. Oops, sorry, I lost my place. So she was a so she was a childhood child child excuse me a child actress um, from China. She goes to school and then she she was um, really inspired by an air like an airplane show that she saw in Paris, um, and it sort of it it struck a, a big curiosity for her. Um, so she decided she wanted to um, she wanted to learn how to fly planes. 
So she was, so at the time that she, that she um, would have been, by the time that she was in this, in there for the ceremony of the Gina Poblana ceremony at China City and Oveda Street, um, she was 24 years old. She was an airline pilot for the Chinese Red Cross. Um, and the year uh, that year of the festival, she was on a goodwill tour of the U.S. and Canada. Um, so she was gathering aid and supplies for China, who had already, as I mentioned, already entered World War II, and and by that time were um, in need of of supplies and aid. So, but as a as a woman aviator, um, a Chinese woman aviator, she was an anomaly, especially I mean in China, but also in the U.S. Right. Women were generally not permitted um, to have pilot's licenses in countries across the country, or across, excuse me, across the world at this time. Um, Amelia Earhart had just completed her first solo set, fo excuse me, her first solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean just a few years prior. So that was in 1932. So Lee wanted to learn how to fly planes and she had to um, campaign quite a bit um, to be admitted into a pilot school. So the first one she went to was in Switzerland. Um, and a year later, she went to the pilot school at the Boeing School of Aeronautics in Oakland. In both of these institutions, she obtained um, private license, private pilot license. Um, and then she returned to China. Um, she was able to, to get a, 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 private, a private pilot's license, but not a government license. Um, so she was the first, the first woman pilot um, who, to receive a license in all three of these countries. Um, and so the Chinese government, though, refused to give her a license, um, a government license, because she was a woman. And so she had the private license, and she, um, the Chinese government did not issue her um, a government license. And this was even after she had volunteered to fly for their military. Um, so following um, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, she she um, she volunteered to fly for the military, and they said no because she was a woman. Um, so instead, she she launched a, um, some refugee camps um, and hospital for wounded soldiers, um, and and in this process of doing this, she was marked um, by Japan by the as an enemy of Japan, right? Um, and so eventually, she flee she had to flee. Um, she fled China, and um, and then she was able to obtain a, a commercial pilot's license. The government allowed her to get a, com a commercial license, but not a government license, um, but permitted her to fly for the Red Cross. Um, so that's how she ends up in the United States um, on the Goodwill tour. So, so this um, just to give you also a sense of. Her, she, so she's she's seen as a very um, like a very good example in China and in the United States of of what uh, of, of of an independent right modern woman, right? She she's she's sort of defying these um, these gender roles in in so many different ways. Um, she's traveling across the United States and Canada to um, uh, representing China, so she's she becomes a spokesperson. Um, so she is the she is also in the face of China. So she's she's the face of right. She ends up being the face of um, of China City, and just in the instance of that of that um, the one um, sort of festival um, that that the, the newspaper article started out with, but she also was um, the face of China across the United States and Canada, sort of um, encouraging. Um, American and Canadian audiences that China was going to be on the ally side. The United States still had not entered the war yet. Um, also in that year, she appeared in Disputed Passage, uh, which was a Hollywood film um, that came out in 1938 um, and starred Do Dorothy L'Amour. And this is Dorothy L'Amour is pictured here in the, um, or, or her likeness is pictured here in this in this uh, flyer for the, or post poster for, for the film. Um, and Dorothy L'Amour actually is, she's not quite in yellow face, but um, she plays a white woman who grew up in China and who is too Chinese to, to be with a white um, soldier in the United States. Um, so there's sort of this, still this like sort of racial othering of, of, um, of her. So she's not, she, it, she couldn't be um, played by a Chinese actress because 
interracial relationships were still prohibited in the United States. This is the era when um, um, laws, actual laws and um, racial practices prohibited interracial mixtures. So, um, so this, this character um, was one way that American film could um, sort of portray this kind of otherness and this kind of like um, um, illicit romance, um, right? But Li Yaching, she she was um, she was young, she was beautiful, right? She was modern, she was patriotic, um, and so she was she was just a really like sort of perfect figure to include in um, in something like um, in in any kind of, any kind of publicity um, sort of event that was going on at this time. And let's see. Yeah, so when she was on the Goodwill tour, she um, she toured um, 40 cities across the United States. And um, and in um, when her visit to Oakland, um, which was in, in 1939, so a month after, actually, in, in January of 1939, a month after the, the newspaper article, um, she um, she the Oakland Tribune reported that she had affirmed national uh, unification in China so that China had um, unified across its provinces, and this would assure the United States that China was on the U.S. side. Um, and um, in Hollywood circles, she was she was pretty well known, and so that we know that also that Hollywood um, people would come to China City in part to be able to um, sort of rub elbows with um, with Hollywood folks who who would spend time there. Okay. So. Um, so again, so I think that so these are the these are the things that I've explored so far, and I'm really looking forward to exploring more about these topics. Um, bringing in um, especially the the rich oral histories that the Chinese Historical Society has um, and has done. Um, I haven't had a chance to incorporate those into into the writing yet, um, but it's something that's that's the sort of next on my list. Um, but I think that this, that what what I do want to point out here is that um, that there is this story about what what these girls and these women um, how how Chinese girls and how how Mexican girls and women were being portrayed um, in 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 this time period and at the same time also trying to claim um, a kind of modern identity um, a, and as we know um, in for the Chinese American community is a, a Chinese American identity that that emerges in this time period as well. So um, these, these identities, um, um, what it means to be a modern girl or a modern young woman, um, they kind of, they, they contradict some of these tourist spaces, but at the same time, they are also produced by these, um, these tourist spaces in which these um, um, women and girls sometimes worked. So, um, so that's what I have for today. Thank you for, bearing with me, um, and this is in this in this very new topic. Um, so I welcome questions, suggestions, anything that you might have. Thank you very much, Isa. And uh, you know, this is just a, a additional territory that I think merits more discussion and more inquiry. And uh, I know that uh, I have some questions, but uh, I didn't see too many questions in the chat. And so if anyone has any commentary, uh, well, there was a, an early question asking um, more about, uh, well, to be a little bit more specific about the boundaries of those two locations, uh, Alvera Street and uh, China City. Um, is that something that could easily be described? You mentioned the-, the boundaries. Uh, yeah, the access, the uh... oh, the boundaries of the tourist zone. Right, right. right. Um, yeah, you know, actually, um, thank you, Linda, for that question. It's, it's, um, it. Well, China City was very well bounded because it was within the walls, right? Um, Oveda Street also had a very distinct sort of space that it took up, um, but as far as like the tourist zone. The bigger um, uh, tourist zone. Um, I don't know about specific boundaries, but it is important to think about these three places together. So, and they're actually literally on in a in a cross, right? Like in a, a at a at an intersection, right? Between um, what was Macy Street, Macy Street and Alameda Street. Um, so 
that um, the southern, the south, it would be the south, sorry, the south east corner was, uh, you know, has currently also has the East Union Station, and then the southwest corner, um, Olvera Street, and then the northwest corner was China City. And so they're kind of, they're like all kind of right there. Um, and, and, and so it wasn't necessarily something that was defined um, explicitly, like sort of bounded explicitly um, with um, with lines <laughs> by the city. Um, but there are, you know, these things that were um, happening simultaneously. If I could interject here, yeah. uh, it seems that because both China City and Alberta Street were both on the west side of Alameda, where the railroad tracks were, and it ran from there to a rail yard, and on the east side was Old Chinatown and the Mexican and Mexican American neighborhood of uh, Ramirez Street and so on. Both of those areas on the east side of Alameda were perhaps perceived as a in a negative way. You know that they didn't have paved streets, and they or maybe if they did, um, it was an area where. Uh, what was it? There, there was a, a sus suspicion that there was a plague in the Mexican American neighborhood, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, other uh, things that were negatively perceived. Um, and I want I want to morph, morph into this other question. So, did modernity perhaps mean that here were these sanitized places, and also that these were places that fit? the white woman's perception of modernity. Mm -hmm. So is that, uh, do, do, was there dialogue in, in the white community that, that might have um, provided uh, uh, guidance for how mm -hmm. Mexican American women and Chinese American women should behave and present themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there had long been um, sort of these this idea of what it what it would mean for um, for well, for many many different groups of of non white communities in the United States, but um, in particular in Los Angeles, um, you know, there was there was a lot of reformers that that were um, were here in the nineteenth um, late nineteenth century into the early twentieth century, and there. Um, their projects were to Americanize um, right Chinese communities and Mexican communities, and they focused a lot on women. Um, and so a lot of the, that that focus was sort of teaching um, sort of American styles of housekeeping, right? Um, teaching sewing, teaching English, um, teaching um, ha housekeeping, um, and um, and so that 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 continued even into the 30s. So actually the um, they, it wasn't necessarily in the same way as reform had been, but um, it had by the 1930s become more like charity work. So it's actually the, the Department of Charities of um, Los Angeles that, um, that helped to facilitate a lot of um, uh, Mexicans leaving during this period. Um, they would give them one-way tickets to Mexico if they, um, and you know when they would come to 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 for for supplies like food right and and things so a lot of the argument was that um, Mexicans and other people of color were taking up these resources that now now the white population needed because of the depression and so one way tickets were a sort of one way um, in addition to like the very dramatic um, deportation rate that happened at the plaza. Um, so that and that was actually done by the same people who um, were doing that charity work, um, charity work in, in by the time of the 1930s, um, but reform work before that. that. That's interesting. So if you didn't conform to our model, then uh, there might be consequences. Um, I uh, saw a response in the uh, chat from Munson Clock defining the describing the boundaries of China City. It's roughly Ord, Spring, Alameda, and Macy, one city block, and the parking lot of Philippe's today, the French dip sandwich place, is essentially the uh, the footprint of China City, uh, and there might be a few remaining structures left. 
So thank you, Munson. Uh, I don't see other questions. Maybe if I uh, point questions. out to you, can you see them, Isa? Yeah, yeah. How um, many Chinese lived in LA at the time of China City, and how many were female? I don't know if we have a population. I don't, I don't have a, the population numbers off the top of my head, but there actually weren't that many. I mean, there weren't that many women, um, in part because that was what the way that the Chinese exclusion policies were designed to um, especially keep out women. Um, so there was only a, there was a brief period in the early early 20th century, like in the, the 20s when uh, or no, teens. 20, if I remember, um, I can't remember exactly the years, but there was a brief period where women who were married to merchants could come you know, legally into the United States. And so it is when when those women are able to come to, to L.A. where we see um, just this huge population, I shouldn't say huge, but a significant population of, um, of, of Chinese children being born in the United States. Uh, or in in Los Angeles, um, and I say that's big, but by those standards, it was actually not that big. <laughs> These are small communities. There weren't that many people, so there. So yeah, so that's that's a really important point. There weren't that many Chinese um, Chinese women in Los Angeles um, residents at this time, more than before, but not very many. Um, I, I actually have another question, and that is, you know, you, you commented about uh, our. Uh, um, what was it? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Caterina de San Juan, and I see that she was actually sainted. So, am I to understand that she's was actually Chinese or part Chinese? So that's part of um that it ha that has not been um, confirmed. <laughs> so that so a lot of it is like this uh is you know sort of folklore about who she was um some some of the some of the stories say that she was an enslaved um she was an enslaved person um that was brought to um to mexico or what is now mexico um and that then she was then she um once one of the stories said that she she married there, there was an, a chinese man that she had married um in 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 the area where she was living um but you know, like like I mentioned, there's some some accounts will say or some renditions of the story say that she was Chinese. Some renditions say maybe she possibly could have been Filipina, um, maybe she could have been Indian. Um, you know that oftentimes um, Asian Asian in in span in Mexican uh, Spanish is often Chino is just sort of the uh, the umbrella term used instead of um, um, Asiatico, which would be like the proper Asian, term Asian. Um, so some, I think that might be also part of um, part of the story here, the language. Um, so yeah, so there's not, um, but there is definitely influence right from Asia. Um, I've seen like uh, um, um, some some discussions where they've talked about um, that she might have been part of the Manila trade, and that that embroidery comes from um, Philippines. So. Um, so you know, there's there's all these sort of different ideas of who she was, but I. think I think especially during this period, um, Mexican nationalism, when Mexican identity is being redefined, um, that Mexico um, um, is defining itself as a mestizo na nation, and and by mestizo they mean um, mixed mixed nation, a mixed race nation, but in particular, especially right, indigenous and Spanish um, heritage. So even though there's sort of, there's some exclusion, um, some inclusion of um, Asian and um, black heritage, um, that largely gets left out as, as um, Mexican nationalism continues. Um, and actually, um, Mestizo, mestizo identity becomes almost a whitening, uh, a whitening idea um, there. So, so there was actually um, in Mexico during the revolution, um, there was um, very, very violent anti-Chinese movement. Um, many Chinese people came to the United States um, having been pushed out of, by the violence that was happening during the revolution. And sometimes the United States would, um, would uh, allow them to take refuge. Um, not always, but also, um, you know, there's a number of uh, Mexico, like the United States, um, and a number of other um, Latin American countries had um, anti-Asian laws and policies. 
um, Mexico also had uh, had um, Japanese internment. And so there's so we see that there's um, you know these are not these are not just U.S. issues, um, unfortunately. I'm uh, so uh, Robert asked the name of the dress that you illustrated was China. I'm guessing Poblana, but did the China refer to China or were, was there another connotation? Yeah. You might so, have already answered that, but you can... Oh, yeah. So I, I should say that um, in Spanish, um, China means Chinese and it also means China. <laughs> um, so so a lot of times um, in Spanish, people say, um, say Chinos or Chinas, they mean um, Chinese people or Asian people. Um, so that's that's um, that's where where some of that I think the language what I was saying about the language um, might have might contribute to the understanding of this folklore story. Um, um, I saw any, another question. Any other closing? Well, so maybe we'll just have some or closing comment here. I, I don't see any other questions. I see a lot of friends out here, but uh, everyone's quiet. I know that if we were all in the same room, the, you know, well, there would be a lot of buzz. But uh, I, I think this it's still great to be able to hear you and to be able to learn uh, from you. Um, so, what 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 do you think might be your timeline on uh, on this research? I, I know that I, that's probably a hard question because I know that you're working full time too. Um. Just really quick before, but I just I see one more question that Jan, Janice asked. Um, and I only see one chart in the memory of, and there, were there other charts? So yeah, in the picture, um, I, I forgot to mention that. So it looks like kind of like a a, a trifold kind of um, poster ish kind of um, um, plaque behind the shrine. And so the one that I, that that you're able to see if you zoom in really quickly, uh, or, or really into, if you zoom in really really far. Um, is in English, but the the one then there's one in Chinese and there's one in Spanish, on either side. Um, okay, so you're asking about the timeline for this this project. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> I'm just sort of starting out. Um, it's kind of a weird feeling to start a new project because I've been working on the other one for you know a, a decade and a half, more than a decade and almost two decades. Um, so um, so it's kind of exciting, but also a little bit like what. This is a little bit um, scary and new, um, but I, um, you know, I'm just I'm really excited to, um, you know, have be a part of the, um, the Chinese Historical Society as I'm working on this too. Great. Well, so, uh, Isa um, or Professor Quintana, uh, mm -hmm. on behalf of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, we'd like to thank you very much for your sharing a little bit of your research, and we're looking forward to more.